Welcome to week five of the Presidential Smackdown. Welcome to week five of the Presidential Smackdown. Andy, it has been a wild, wild week. Uh, we have done our simulations and we'll go ahead and start showing you those right now. Our first one up is uh, one of, we'll say, a favorite of ours, Peanut Farmer Jimmy Carter taking on the 0-3 FDR. This was a interesting match for me to watch because I, I thought Jimmy Carter had it all the way. I, I really did. He was at home. He had played strong every game up to this point. But midway through, I had a lot of alarms going off in my head. I was like, this is not looking as good for Carter as I thought. He kept it close. Uh, he was only down like 3% midway. He was up a percent or two, like mid-late game. So this was a very back-and-forth game. You saw him competing in Florida, North Carolina, Virginia. But like as the week started to end and when it came down to Election Day, he underperformed, and he ended up giving up his, uh, he was the, uh, one of our few undefeated presidents, and he took a W from someone who was 0-3. FDR really, really needed a win, and he got his first win of the season. Yeah, Ashton, I really do love me some Jimmy Carter in this, you know, presidential SmackDown. Sad to see him lose, but it's really hard to go 10 weeks and not have a single loss. So, no sweat off his back. He's still going to be a very strong candidate. But FDR was, going into the simulation series, we thought FDR was going to be a solid candidate. But before this week, he was 0-3. So, it was very good to see FDR finally get his first win. And it could not have come against a better, more strong opponent than an undefeated Jimmy Carter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really key thing for Jimmy Carter to like Jimmy Carter's losing seating so badly now because of that loss. Um, the DNC again is just struggling mightily, um, even if it's against themselves. But uh, we'll, we'll see if they can keep up against the Republicans and hopefully Bill Clinton can get an easy W against Taft. So, Andy, let's go ahead and go on to this next game, Truman versus JFK. JFK, which I think we both agreed we thought would be really good in the SmackDown, but he had an underwhelming start to the season. He goes in this game in a critical, critical conference game, trying to stay on top of his division, the DNC North, against Truman. And Truman comes into this game 1-2, he needed a win to go 500. Uh, going halfway through, it it looked very, very promising for um, Truman. I, I really thought Truman was, he was really duking it out. But then you started seeing slowly JFK as the Republican, the, the way candidate, starting getting some like really good footholds in the Midwest and in the southeast, and then, like, it just, there there wasn't a back and forth this game. This was just JFK slowly asserting his dominance the whole game, and it will end up, as you guys see right here, it'll end up with JFK having a decently big margin of victory at 307 to 231. I really like what I'm seeing out of JFK in this series action. He does have one loss, but I am pretty sure that was against Abe Lincoln in week one of our marquee matchup there. First ever marquee matchup all the way five weeks ago. Hard to believe. I like JFK. He's after that rebounded nicely. He moves up to undefeated in his division, beating being 2-0 and after the win against Truman. So he's out there. He's you know styling and profiling, getting those W's and as of right now, you know, we'll get to the seating in a little bit, but he's looking at the number one powerhouse in the entire Democratic conference. So he's a tough one to beat. And Truman saw the lesser of two, uh, the lesser of him this week as JFK wins. 
let's go ahead and go on to Woodrow Wilson versus Obama. And I was kind of interested to see um, how Obama would kind of keep on going after a kind of weak performance. He got the W in week three, but barely got it at 275. That was a close call for Obama. So I was interested to see how he rebounded against a um a Woodrow Wilson that he himself was had a positive record. He was two and one. So he had some good things to look at his earlier performances in the week. And going on, Obama was just there there wasn't a lot of competition early on. Um this is another one where once Obama got a foothold, he got it a little bit earlier than the game we were just talking about with um Truman and JFK. Obama just got the foothold. Like as you can see, middle of the game, the Southeast is entirely red. That's hard to do in this game. Um just to keep so many states pure blue or red and he just kept on doing it and when you see that it's really hard to win otherwise and you know obama picked off some northeastern states even got massachusetts to go republican so it was a really impressive game by obama he pulls out a solid win uh, with 85.91 million votes so pretty good vote total too I think one of the most interesting things about this matchup, Ashton, is just the sheer amount of enthusiasm for both candidates you see in that popular vote, both candidates hitting over 80 million. That is tough to see. You look at other matchups from this week, it's just you don't see really over 80 million for much of any of them, especially for both candidates. So it shows that Wilson is not no slouch. A lot of people like Wilson. And but just versus Obama, he just is outmatched. Obama is really, really good. We've seen one one bad loss earlier in the year, earlier in the weeks. But again, like JFK, shrugged it off, has been going, styling, profiling, like I said. He's two and oh in the in his division in the DNC West. And you know, as we're getting about the halfway point of the season, we're starting to see these like top dogs take shape, and Obama is definitely one of them. Yeah, in that loss in week two, Obama had 255 electoral votes with 82 million. So Obama really gets good popular vote numbers almost always. The question is, can he win the electoral college consistently? And so far, he has. Moving right along, guys, we have a matchup, kind of a rematch from last week, as Dwight D. Eisenhower, the undefeated candidate as the away Democrat, takes on George W. Bush in his own division there. You have last week Ike just destroying George W. Bush, and as this matchup gets underway, it's kind of it's a if even like fifty fifty kind of battle. But you look towards the middle week eight, week nine, week ten area, and Dwight Eisenhower had at one point Florida, Pennsylvania, and Ohio all in his expansion pack, which is tough to win as a Republican if if you have a Democrat like Ike just taking control of these states, but. As the matchup keeps going on, you see George W. kind of keeping it close somehow in New York, keeping it close, gets Ohio back to that 50-50 state. Ike is losing grip on some of his other states. Like, he doesn't have any control up in Michigan and Wisconsin going up into Week 10 and 12. And as this matchup keeps going on the way, you see a lot of 50-50 states. So you really don't know how this match is going to go. Arizona is a huge state that George W. Bush really got from the get-go and and held solid red. Nevada was up for grabs, and it came really close down to the wire getting into Week 20. And Florida became a flippity-flip state up in the late portions of the week. You had Florida, Iowa, even up in the northwest Oregon was was a flip state for Bush. So, you know, as we go into the results of the night you see a lot of a lot of red as you can see george w bush wins states like north carolina and florida and ohio it really catapulted him to an early lead and it you know it looks kind of grim because michigan wisconsin all go for eisenhower so it comes really close down but when eisenhower took iowa you thought bush was gonna not be able to overcome that 
He he keeps all of the states you think he's going to do. He steals Colorado away from Arizona. That was a big state he got. And he also stole Arizona. That pushed him over the 270 mark. Got some other states to add, pat on to his stats. Like Oregon but ends up winning a 292 to 246 electoral college matchup there. And it was a good, solid win for Bush. And that is the first loss for Dwight Eisenhower in this presidential smackdown. Moving on to an RNC West showdown as the impeached president, Richard Nixon, takes on good old Ronald Reagan. I think Reagan was very strong out from the get-go. Reagan is a much better candidate than Nixon. Nixon has struggled through this presidential match. Only one win so far up until this matchup. And it doesn't really, enough from the get-go, doesn't look like he's going to get anywhere close to that second win. Reagan, being from California, always helps him keep that state in his expansion pack, keeps it very healthy for him as the Republican candidate here. Florida was always tough there. North Carolina was 50-50, but Reagan just goes in as a Republican, and he's winning Michigan. He's winning Wisconsin. He's winning, keeping it close in places like Pennsylvania and Florida. He's going to lose, it looks like, North Carolina going into the later weeks, but getting all of really the blue wall states for Reagan is what kept it up. It really wasn't. It was close for the uh, somewhat of some of the weeks, but as you get into election night, you see Reagan just start picking off, and it just it starts in New Hampshire and Maine. Again, those two states really show kind of the outlook for the rest of the night as Reagan goes on a tear, winning Pennsylvania, winning Michigan, winning Wisconsin, winning winning all those states, winning Florida as well. It just didn't look good there for for Nixon winning Georgia Reagan also wins and this it was over really before it began after Texas he hit 270 and he kept rolling with Arizona he kept rolling throughout the night stealing states that you didn't think and Reagan will get a good impressive 319 to 219 electoral college map and moves on to four and one in the presidential smackdown Moving right along, guys, to a cross-party matchup. Kind of an interesting one that you don't see very often. And that is Andrew Jackson, Trail of Tears versus H.W. Daddy Bush. H.W. has been a very strong sleeper candidate. And you see that as the Republican here. He was doing very good in states like Florida and North Carolina. Off the bat, Arizona, he kept very strong from the beginning. That he just is a really strong candidate, which is very shocking to see. You get into the midport of the match. He has Wisconsin, Michigan, and Minnesota all for him. Virginia goes to H.W. Bush. Nevada, Arizona, at one point, it looked like he could possibly get the entire map red, except for, obviously, New York and California. But he just kept it up, kept going good, played very well throughout the whole match. And it really just... Nick Jackson had no chance to come back as... H.W. Bush was just on fire in every state. The only state that really was blue was New York and Maryland at points of this match getting in late. So it looked like maybe Bush could just sweep the whole thing. But as you got closer to the end, you see more of the blue states coming out, like Illinois and California. Pennsylvania went blue, which was big. New Mexico and Iowa was flip states. Michigan went back to Jackson. Maybe he could pull it off, but you really don't see that as Florida went strong for him off the bat in election night. You're going to see H.W. get New Hampshire and other little states there. He wins New York, which was huge for a Republican to come in there and win New York State, Virginia, North Carolina, Florida. It was over before it began. Georgia, Ohio just swept the entire Southeast. Getting New York was huge because that's one of the only paths to victory for Democrats to keep New York. Loses Wisconsin also. It just did not look good at all for Jackson, especially after Minnesota. Texas, he, he's going to hit 270 right after hitting Texas, but he was already at 267 before. So a complete blowout for Dad H.W. Bush. As he's going to end up with a, three, a 360, 66 electoral count after winning a Hawaii against a 172 for Jackson. H.W. Bush continues his dominance in this series and moves up to 4-1. and one. Because of his schedule not having any buys. So very good, strong performance by H.W. Bush. And he gets the W. All right, Ashton. After all our week 
five simulations before tonight's main event. Let's go ahead and throw up those current standings. All right, guys, there you go. Those are the current standings after week five before the matchup tonight. Ashton, what is, do you see anything that's kind of standing out to you? What have you seen so far through the first five weeks and your reactions to these current standings? Yeah, Andy, really the RNC South is looking like the best division in the entire matchup or game so far. I mean, Lincoln, Ike, and George Bush, all three are surprising. And I, you know, mostly uh, three of the losses in that division are from the division itself, which is crazy. So only one other team outside of the division has beaten someone in this division. So it's a very strong your know, RNC South. Um, I got to say, whoever comes out of that division will be favorited on the Republican side to go through the playoffs. If you look at that DNC South, Ashton, after Jimmy Carter's shocking loss this week, it's a much more competitive division, especially tonight. It gives a lot more weight to tonight's matchup because if Clinton can beat off big boy Taft, he goes up and he ties with with Carter at the 3-1 and 1-0 and and in the division. That's important to watch out. Taft, 0-3, 0-2. He's one of the only candidates. Him and LBJ are the only two candidates across the board that has not won a matchup. So those those two candidates are pretty much out of it, we can safely say. Ford and Nixon are looking like they could pretty much be out of it, along with like Jackson, uh, FDR, and Truman. But there's still a lot more weeks. They can turn it around now. But... We're start like I said earlier. We're starting to see these divisions take shape, and the RNC South, like you said, is definitely the most competitive division. Mm-hmm. The only division with three three wins by each candidate, and it's just going to be a tough, tough task to see which of those candidates are going to be mm-hmm. missing the playoffs. Yeah, I will definitely say I don't think zero and three is automatically out. It's when you get that fourth loss because you only have eight games in the SmackDown. So if you don't if you get a fourth loss, the best you can do is 500. So Taft has to win this matchup. It'll be interesting to see if he can pull it out. I think you'll agree with me, Andy. I don't have Taft winning this. I think Bill Clinton has been underrated. Um, both of his win or one of his wins was very impressive. And he had a decently bad loss. Only got 233 in that one. Still got 77 million votes. And he got he won a close game in week four. So I'm interested to see who can pull it out. Yeah, Ashton, I also can't agree with you. I think Clinton is going to win tonight. Taff has just been really underperforming, which kind of segues into the last thing we will talk about before getting into tonight's main event versus Taft and Clinton. Ashton, when you look across these standings, which candidate – are you most impressed about so far through halfway of the season? Halfway through the season, I would say George H. W. Bush. I think I really didn't expect, of course, um, as you guys can see, George H. W. Bush, um, he had a very, very bad loss week one. I I thought me and you were starting to write him off week one. He only got 135. That's one of the lowest totals anyone in the SmackDown has ever gotten. But he picked himself off, dusted himself off, just like off. And he has been wrecking shop every match afterwards. His lowest... A vote total so far after that week one loss has been 326. So he has been very consistent and very wrecking shop up to this point. I got to agree with you, Ashton. I'm actually going to say both the Bushes are my most impressive candidates. Both of Daddy and Son Bush has been performing very well. If you put W. Bush in any other division, he might be the number one guy there. He's three and two, but he's facing a division where the rest of the candidates are also three and one so he is performing and living up to that rmc south billing we've already talked about hw bush he's been after week one just amazing to watch and they have to be my most um impressing candidates so far 
All right, guys, time to move on to our marquee matchup of this week five of the presidential SmackDown. It's been a crazy week so far, but let's go ahead and jump right into our matchup, which is Bill Clinton versus Big Boy Taft. Yeah, so <clears throat> as uh, everyone watching can notice, like the home state for each candidate typically is more competitive just because they start off with a better um a higher favorability in that state and a higher base energy. So that's why you typically see some of these, like it, depending on the state, uh, the candidate from it being very competitive. That doesn't mean they always win it, but it means it's more competitive. So that's why it's always interesting to see someone like Bill Clinton from Arkansas. He always does good there in the simulations. And, but, you know, someone like Taft, I think Taft, Andy, his biggest drawback is the fact that his energy isn't high and he doesn't do that a lot every turn or it doesn't do that much every turn. Yeah, that, that really in, in this kind of style game, if you have no stamina, if you're a big boy like Taft, you can't really get any kind of lead because your opponent just does so much more per turn. So it's tough to see that. It makes sense, and it's going to make it a tough time for Taft in this matchup. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say for critical states, Taft has to win Ohio. He has to win a state like Florida and keep a hold to the rest of his base and try to pick off one or two other states. For Bill Clinton, really all he has to do is focus on either the Midwest or picking off a state or two on top of Arkansas. So we'll see if they both can do it. Um, Andy, what are some states you'll be looking at during this matchup? I got to look at the southeast states, North Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. We know how sleepy Taft is, and I can see those states very well shifting for Clinton because you know before uh, Joe Biden's recent victory, Bill Clinton was the last Democrat to win Georgia. So I am very much looking at the state of Georgia and the southeast. Yeah, right now Arkansas is pulling heavily for Bill Clinton. No shocker there. Texas is relatively close in Florida. So, you know, you see Taft here struggling a little bit. Um, Bill Clinton kind of expanding the map. Um, uh, Taft has some outreach in Washington, so we'll, we'll keep an eye on that, Andy. Um, oh, look at that popular vote tick, Andy, 48 to 42. That's not looking so good for big boy Taft. It is not, Ashton. We've already seen how Bill Clinton has jumped out to an early lead. And with, you know, we, we've already established Taft's sleepiness is not going to help him get back in the race. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and look how many states are dark blue and only one state dark red, and that's Georgia. Not a good sign. I'm actually surprised that you Georgia is so dark red. Like I said, I thought Clinton could maybe steal that, but it's still another. We still got many more weeks, and I can still see Clinton doing more damage as he already has been doing good. Yeah, Andy, I don't know if it's over yet. We've seen some close games where people come back, but like to me, Taft's record me that if he gets behind, he just can't pull it out. Yeah, man, Andy. Uh, let's look at these southeast states. He's barely winning Oklahoma, losing Louisiana, and tied in Mississippi. Ashton, you can see. Look at South Carolina. I know we have already kind of talked about the southeast, but it's it's interesting to see how good Clinton is doing. Like I said before this matchup, you had to look at the southeast, and he's doing well except for Georgia. And then the other Republican states, just Taft really can't hold on to any of the – in a very strong way to any of his core states, as you can see around the map, just not as strong support as Taft needs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the thing is, it's like you see Bill Clinton building off of his Northeast and Western um, base and just reaching into these now lower Midwest states like Kentucky, West Virginia. Those are purple. Ohio's purple. Missouri's purple. Arkansas's purple. Louisiana, Oklahoma, like Almost the entire South is purple besides Georgia and Tennessee and Alabama, and that's, that's not a good thing. So let me go ahead and pause it. It's crazy, Ashton, to see West Virginia being purple or it to me. That's just insane. 
you never would think that a Republican would ever lose a state of West Virginia. But, you know, that's mm-hmm. what, what happens in this presidential smackdown. Yeah. So, Andy, I'm going to go ahead and pause it. And as you can see, Pennsylvania, Michigan's blue. Indiana is blue. Virginia's blue. Almost the rest of the South is either um, is purple besides Georgia, Florida, and Texas. Uh, what's your reaction to this map? And the West Coast has a lot of kind of gray uh, states out there in Arizona and Colorado, still toss-ups. I think our prediction was spot on, Ash, and we, we called it from the beginning. Clinton just coming in here, being the, a lot more stamina-induced candidate, the much more likable candidate. Arkansas was a really good base to jump off of, and he just spread it around some of those other southeastern states, even if he won't get them all, like Alabama or Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Maybe. But he's competitive in all those states regardless. You see across the map that Clinton is really just dominating. This should be a, at least in the 300 electoral vote count, probably in the high 350s, 360, 370 range. But it looking like our prediction, it was spot on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll, we'll see if we're right or not. We have yet to see in primetime game a candidate come back from this far of a deficit on the last week. We've seen someone where it looked like they're going to lose by 30 or 40 electoral votes and come back, but not someone who looks like they're going to lose by maybe 100. So let me go ahead and click play and see how each one does. Okay, our first returns of the night, it looks like the Northeast is going to be very, very blue. Yeah, No no shockers here. Yeah, no shockers in the Northeast. That's a usual Democrat hotspot. Oh, so North Carolina, West Virginia go red. South Carolina, though, goes blue. Florida Ooh. goes blue. I really that... don't see a path for, for for tapped after losing both Florida and South Carolina, Ash. And it he, looks like it's over. He won Ohio but lost Indiana. Yeah, so... that, that basically nails the head in the coffin. You lose Indiana and Florida as a Republican, you really don't have a path unless you somehow flip states in the Midwest, which is not going to happen. Yeah, it looks like what California Clinton has already will seal this. He's at 226 right now. Uh, like Taft will make a closer race than we expected. Um, uh, he wins. Yeah, there it goes. Clinton has won. He has 324 to Taft's 214. Um, no really shocking states for Taft. Taft kind of held most of the basic Republican ones, but lost Indiana. He won Wisconsin, but it, like this is, I will say this is Taft's best map so far, Andy. He was able to win North Carolina, Ohio, and Wisconsin, but lost everything else, including Indiana. Yeah, Ashton, it is sad when a candidate's best performance like Taft's is still a loss. It just shows how bad of a candidate he is. He's going to move to 0-4 after this loss to Bill Clinton, which for all intents and purposes, he is pretty much eliminated from the presidential smackdown unless by chance all of his divisional opponents lose the rest of their games and he wins out. But we don't see that happening. So for all intents and purposes, Taft is eliminated and Clinton moves to 3-1 and and still continues his journey to try to get into the playoffs yeah andy we'll see how they do next week i hope everyone tunes in next week we have some exciting matchups coming andy you want to tell them who is playing next week yes ashton we do have some interesting matchups next week you have you know matchups like teddy Lincoln, a cross-divisional game. That is not the game of the week. And unfortunately, you also have people like Harry Truman and Dwight D. Eisenhower. Reagan and JFK is a very interesting one. And our marquee matchup of the week, Andrew Jackson, the Trail of Tears man himself, takes on good old H.W. Bush, who's been a very good candidate we've seen so far in the presidential SmackDown. So please tune back in next week as we will continue on the week six, getting ever close to the playoffs.